Hey True Crime fans, my name is Freddy. Welcome to my channel, Forensic Connections. In this channel, I'm going to be talking to you about all true crime cases that I've gained knowledge of throughout my time of being a forensic science fan. I've been a forensic science fan since I was a little kid watching Crime 360, First 48, uh, Forensic Files, which is actually my favorite show. Anything that you could name, more than likely I've seen. If you like the content that I'm putting out in my videos, then hit that like button so that YouTube knows that I'm putting out good videos and it can reach true crime fans all around the world. Also, hit that subscribe button so that way you'll be notified the next time I'm putting out videos. I'm going to be trying my best to post at least one case a week. Cases that I like. But if there's a case that you like and you'd like to see me cover, then don't hesitate to write it down in the comments below. I'm going to be checking my comments often, so just let me know how I'm doing also. My first case I'd like to cover is the Woodchipper murder back in 1989, the murder of Hella Kraft, one of the most gruesome stories in American history. So let's not wait any longer, let's jump right in. The Hella Kraft's murder case, aka the Woodchipper murder, is a notorious crime that took place back in 1986 in Newtown, Connecticut. Newtown, Connecticut is a quiet town in the Fairfield County part of Connecticut. In the 80s, it was considered a safe place, a great place to raise your kids and live the American dream. A lot of typical working class families, pretty rare to see any extreme crimes. Most crimes you'd hear about would be typical burglaries, car break-ins, small stuff, you know, no murders or anything over the top like that. Which is why this is where Hella Crafts and her husband Richard Crafts decided to settle and start a new family. The victim, Hella Crafts, was born Hella Lork Nielsen. She was born on July 7, 1947. In the 80s, Hella Crafts was a flight attendant for Pan American Airlines. Her husband, Richard Crafts, was a pilot. They first met in or around 1969 at an airline convention in Miami. They dated for about six years before they decided to tie the knot and settle down in Newtown to begin to start their new family. From the outside looking in, like most couples and marriages, you'd think they had the perfect marriage. But it's just like anybody else. Just like when you see these Facebook couples or, you know, things like that. They only show you what they want you to see. Richard, apart from being a pilot, also worked part-time as a police officer in this local community. You could say he served as a role model figure, as he would go to the schools and talk to the kids about his work. Hella and Richard were very well known in the community. They would go to their kids' schools for career day as flight attendant and pilot parents, which everyone really much enjoyed. It's fair to say with both parents working, the crafts were in need of a nanny for the children. To watch the kids when, you know, they'd be working 80 hours a week or something like that, you know, but they're not around a lot, so they need somebody to watch the kids. They ended up hiring this woman by the name of Don Marie Thomas as their nanny, which will later on play a big role in this case. All right, now fast forward to November 18, 1986. Hella Crafts had arrived back to Newtown from a Frankfurt, Germany flight. She had landed in JFK airport, then her and another flight attendant drove back to Newtown. Said flight attendant dropped Hella off right in front of her home. On the way back from JFK to Hella's house, Hella spoke about how excited she was for Thanksgiving, considering Hella was really big on the holidays. So this was no different. When Hella got home, her, the kids, and Richard sat and had dinner as a family. Between the family dinner, that night it began to snow heavily. A huge snowstorm was on its way. It took over Newtown and a lot of the surrounding area. It was kind of memorable for sure. Considering the fact that it was only November and us New Englanders know we don't usually get heavy snowstorms till later on in the season. The snow was said to be wet and heavy, which caused tons of power outages in that specific county. The next morning when Richard woke up, he noticed that Hella had left an hour early for work because her bags were gone and her car was gone. Um, the power was still out, so he decides to wake the kids and nanny Don Marie tells him to hurry up and get dressed so they can go to his sister's house, Karen, until the power comes back. The nanny was suspicious and asks Richard where Ella was. Richard tells her that she woke up early and left with her flight bags, an indication that would say that she probably was going either to work or had a flight to take somewhere. So Richard drops the kids off and the nanny at his sister's house and then return home to wait till the power came back. 
hours pass, then the power returns, so Richard decides to go back to his sisters to pick up the kids and the nanny to bring them back to the house. And he was supposed to pick them up at like, let's say two o'clock, but ended up coming to pick them up at like 9 p.m. Pretty suspicious, huh? But when they all get back to the house, there's still no sign of Hella. So the dinner on the 18th was the last time anyone had seen her. So we know that between everyone going to sleep that night on the 18th and Richard waking up the next morning, that's the time that she had gone missing. Technically, she went missing without a trace. At this point, there were really no clues or evidence of a crime or anything like that. So everyone was just going by what Richard had said. Like if she just disappeared up and left without a trace. But then the co-workers noticed that the vehicle was still there. Three days after they originally checked, that's when they became more concerned for her safety. On November 25th, Telegraph's close friends and co-workers cared for her so much that considering everything that they already knew, they decided to go file a missing persons report with the local police. So because of the fact that there were no actual facts in this case, you could only imagine what people were thinking. She either got kidnapped or they're serial killers, maybe got murdered. The possibilities are endless. Now let's rewind and talk a little bit about Richard. All right, so I'll tell you a little bit about Richard Crafts. Richard Crafts was born December 20th, 1937 in New York City, son to Lucretia and John Andrew Crafts. He grew up in Darien, Connecticut. It's said that Crafts was super secretive. Richard joined the Marines in 1956 with a five-year contract. He wanted to follow his dad's footsteps and become a pilot. He was first a helicopter pilot in Pensacola, Florida. Then not far after, he got his pilot's license. Richard was pretty much a playboy. He had tons of women back in his day. Women came to him. He wouldn't discriminate. He'll take down anyone. In 1969, while in Florida for a recertification class, that's when he met Hella Nielsen, had an affair with a flight attendant for about 20 whole years. Needless to say that their marriage wasn't all roses, but of course to the outsiders it was perfect. To some people, to Hella's friends, they kind of knew the ins and outs a little bit based on things that she told them. But anyways, in order to have more leverage in the divorce, three months before Hella Crafts went missing, she had hired a divorce lawyer. Her name is Diane Anderson. So now that we know that Hella was planning to divorce Richard, in order for her to have actual evidence of infidelity, Diane suggested that Hella hire a private investigator to follow Richard around and catch him in the act. The investigator that Diane suggested goes by the name of Keith Mayo. The private investigator follows Richard and catches him meeting up with another woman in New Jersey, took pictures of him being close with the woman kissing, hugging, the whole nine. Later, we find out the woman's name is Nancy Dodd. Upon gaining this evidence, Keith Mayo, private investigator, hands over the pictures to Richard's wife, Hella. Upon viewing the photographs of her husband cheating on her, Hella makes a decision to serve Richard with the divorce papers. Richard refused to accept the divorce papers. He knew that a divorce would be bad. Hella would try to take everything from him, considering the fact that she had the photos of him cheating. His biggest fear was her taking full custody of their three children, who he loved so much. Now, these are two parents that were both concerned about their children. They decided to discuss the divorce in a civilized manner when Hella returned back from her flight from Germany on the 18th. Now, let's go back to that story that Richard told her friends about her being in Denmark visiting her sick mother or something. A week has passed and still no word from Hella. The same friends that he told that story to decided to call Hella's mother in Denmark to confirm that story, specifically a woman by the name of Lena Johansson. She decided to find the number and make the call because Richard was giving her false numbers, I believe. Upon reaching contact with Hella's mother, Hella's mother not only confirmed that she hadn't spoken to Hella in weeks, but she also confirmed that she actually wasn't even sick in any shape or form. Richard's story was falling apart. Not only that, but originally, Hellacraft's friends didn't even like Richard to begin with. Not only because of the affairs, what he was known for, but also because they had heard about Richard's supposed treatment towards Hella. 
at this point it's all hearsay but they had heard that he was abusive towards her and there was actually a witness that saw Richard punch her in the face or something along those lines in their house that's another story so now we get to Thanksgiving Richard and the kids spend the holiday at his sister Karen's house this drew more attention towards Richard because of the mixed stories he was telling people because of the fact that they would have thought Hella would definitely appeared by now if nothing happened to her at least because now remember Hella Crafts was big on holidays and everyone knew that it's Thanksgiving and Richard and the kids are celebrating it without her if that's not suspicious then I don't know what is supposedly she told some of her friends that if something was to happen to her just not to assume that it was an accident in other words if she went missing that it wouldn't be willingly that she would have definitely been in contact with any of her friends if something was to happen like if she was to let's just say she wanted to disappear or you know run off with some guy or anything like that she would have been in contact with her friends after missing for so long, Hella's friends decided to go to the police and let them know what they already knew. So after she told the police this, they definitely decided to take Richard in for questioning, finally. So Richard was taken in for questioning by the police sometime the first week of December. So the detectives pressed Richard on his wife's whereabouts, in which he maintained the same story, that his wife just up and left on the morning of the 19th and didn't say where she was going. The detectives didn't believe Richard, not one bit, go figure, in which they decided to ask him to go take a polygraph exam. Richard agreed with no hesitation, to their surprise. On the day of the polygraph exam, Richard was asked various questions about his wife's whereabouts, like if he knew where she was, did he kill his wife, anything along those lines. He ended up passing the exam with flying colors, but he did admit to making up the part about his wife going to Denmark to visit his mother or something. The reason for lying was that he didn't want to air his dirty laundry out. In other words, he didn't want the whole town or the whole world at this point knowing his business, that his wife had left him for another man or something along those lines. At this point, the detectives had no choice but to clear Richard as a suspect. So we're back to square one. No leads, no evidence, no sign of hella crafts. Now, when Richard cleared as a suspect, the detectives decided to bring the reinforcements and task force group. This is my favorite part of every investigation. So the state police were brought in to assist with the chief of forensic laboratories, no other than Mr. Henry Lee, which whom is actually my favorite forensic scientist. I mean, I've heard so much about Henry Lee throughout the years. This guy is amazing. Yeah, this man is the GOAT when it comes to forensic investigations, I'm trying to tell you. So now that they have a whole task force working on the Helicraft's missing person case, they decide to put everything that they know together and find out everything that they can about Helicraft's personal life, like her finances, credit card info, whereabouts, you know, places she hangs out, uh, friends, family, if she had any affairs, you know, the typical stuff that they'd search for when someone goes missing. The task force interviewed just about everyone Hella knew, or that knew Hella, friends and family, co-workers, etc. Needless to say, the investigators were working extremely hard two weeks into Hella's disappearance. The typical rule is, if you don't get a solid lead in the first 48, then the crime is harder to solve. <laughs> we all know that one. Here we are two weeks into this missing woman, wife and mother of three, and her husband didn't do it. No credit card usage or anything of the sort. It was just that the hell had disappeared off the face of the earth. Which makes this case that much more mysterious. Now, this is when the first forensic connection comes in. Eventually, the nanny ends up coming forward to the police, letting them know that she had seen some rust-colored stains in the carpet in the Crafts bedroom. They're no longer there because Richard Crafts had removed the carpet and replaced it. After Don Marie's statement about the stains in the carpet, that puts Richard back in the hot seat as the main suspect. He's not only the main suspect, but he's the only suspect at this point. 
at the end of the day, even though he passed those lie detector exams, there were too many unanswered questions. The whole thing just seemed way too odd. When Don Marie had asked Richard what the stains were, his response was that the stains were from an old kerosene heater that he had pulled out the night of the snowstorm because of the power going out. Richard Crafts never denied the stains on the carpet. He even told private investigator Keith Mayo where he had disposed of the kerosene stained carpet, which was at a landfill somewhere in Newtown. A landfill is a site for disposal of waste materials by burial. In other words, something like a city dump. Keith Mayo took him up on the admission and made his way to the landfill. Now, when we talk about this situation, about the landfill and the evidence found at the landfill, there are different accounts of what actually happened. So I'm just going to tell you my understanding of what happened, but it might not be fully accurate, but it's from my understanding. So Keith Mayo took him up on that admission and he made his way to the landfill in search of this kerosene stained carpet that he spoke of from the craft's bedroom because he wanted to make sure that it was actually what Richard was saying and not a lie, you know? After a whole day of looking through the landfill for this carpet, they struck gold by finding that carpet. When he found the carpet, he then handed it over to the task force I told you about earlier for none other than the forensics team to take a look at it. Unfortunately, when the forensics team analyzed the carpet, there was absolutely no trace of any kind of DNA or forensic evidence that tied neither Hella or Richard to it. Heath was bent on his suspicion that Richard was their guy and he wasn't about to give up. He worked one-on-one -on -one with Hella so he felt strongly about this case like he had some sense of duty to fulfill. Because of the fact that Keith was so adamant, the task force decided to look deeper into Richard Kraft's financial records. They wanted to speak to anyone they could to find out if Richard had made any odd purchases within the last month or so that would in some way tie him to the disappearance of his wife, Hella. The task force looked into his credit card usage to find out that Richard had purchased new bedding the following day after the snowstorm. Sheets, comforters, pillows, and pillowcases, things of that nature, which the investigators found quite random and odd. Upon further investigation, the credit card company disclosed that Richard had rented a wood chipper during the storm the night that helicrafts went missing, which instantly made the investigators suspicious. After finding that he re-rented the wood chipper, they ended up digging deeper and finding a few more suspicious items, such as a deep freezer, a washing machine, and he rented a U-Haul as well. With all the receipts the investigators gathered, it gave them enough probable cause for the judge to grant a search warrant for the Kraft's home. On Christmas Day, December 25th, 1986, the task force decided to move in on the warrant for the Kraft's home. Richard and the children were down south for the holiday in Florida, which will be perfect for the investigators not to only catch Richard off guard, but to be able to execute the warrant without any incident. He didn't have any time to dispose of any evidence, if there was any. And it was also said that the task force didn't want to put the children through any more stress and embarrassment than they have already been through, considering the fact that they had already lost their mother and were suffering through the stress of their father being the suspect. So let's talk about this search. When police entered to the crab's home, it was said to have been disorganized and messy. There were a lot of things thrown into the fireplace that were burned. Carpets were ripped up off the floor. Needless to say that the house was a disaster, according to the investigators. Forensic investigator Henry Lee himself found a king-size mattress standing up on its side off of the frame. When he flipped the mattress the right way, he ended up finding blood spatter on the end of the mattress near where the nanny had said that she saw 
the rust-colored stains on the carpet that Richard had claimed to be kerosene. He immediately grabbed his scissors and cut out the blood stain from the mattress and safely secured it in the plastic bag. They swabbed the mattress blood spatter sample and sent it to the lab for comparison. Upon DNA analysis, since back in the day, the DNA testing wasn't as advanced as it is nowadays, obviously. They could only tell so much. For example, they were able to tell that the blood sample from the king size mattress was from a female, and they were able to tell that it was O blood type, which Hella was a female, and she was also O type blood. A snowplow driver comes forward with the statement that he had drove by the night of the snowstorm and saw Richard Crafts working a wood chipping machine on the bridge over the Housatonic River. He was able to remember clearly again because of the snowstorm no one was out. It was basically just the city workers who were driving their plows. There was absolutely no civilians out on the road. So now we have the testimony that Richard Crass was on the bridge working a wood chipper pointed towards Lake Zor. The day after the investigators brought in CSU to sift through all the wood chips near the bridge. As this is happening, the local media catches wind and heads down towards the bridge to cover the story. The weather was so cold, it took the CSU team 10 days to sift through all the wood chips and determine what was actual evidence. But as almost always with these guys, Hard work paid off, and they got their evidence they were hoping to find. They found 56 little pieces of bones and 2,660 hairs. They found a tooth with some dental work done to it, and they also found a dental crown, half of a toenail, and part of a finger, and about three ounces of human flesh. With all the evidence they found on the bridge, they had their body, or what was left of it at least. Upon examining the bone chips, they were able to find out what exactly happened to the body of Hella Crafts. The killer used a wood chipper to dispose of her body over the lake, whoever the killer was. He thought he was smart enough by disposing the body through the wood chipper, but didn't count on all the pieces of the human remains the wood chipper blew over the shore under the bridge. Apparently, the plan didn't go as planned, and not all of the body went inside the lake. In my view, had all those human remains landed in the lake, then this case might have never been solved. The 2,660 hairs that they found at that scene were consistent with the hairs that were found on the hairbrush that belonged to Hella Crafts that night they went to do the search warrant. They didn't stop there though. The investigators were going hard because they knew if they found that evidence, there was sure to be more. They ended up finding some shredded mail which ended up being some mail addressed from Hella Craft's mother. They found a piece of turquoise fabric that the nanny identified as being Hella Craft's favorite nightgown. They also found two human nails with pink nail polish on them. Henry Lee tested that nail polish with every single bottle of pink nail polish owned by Hella Craft's at that time, and it ended up being a match for one of the bottles. To add insult to injury for the killer, the dive team that the CSU brought in found a chainsaw at the bottom of Lake Zor. There was still pieces of human flesh on the chainsaw. Crazy. When they went to go get the serial number off the chainsaw, it was sanded off. But good old forensic comes in. They were able to restore the serial number off of the chainsaw. They traced that serial number to a store that sells chainsaws in Newtown. Without hesitation, the investigators spoke to the owner of that store. The owner happened to keep all his receipts in the shoebox. When they saw the receipt, the chainsaw went for $4.99. The signature on the receipt was none other than 
Mr. Richard Crafts himself. Serial number E5921617. Will go down in infamy. At this point, the investigators now had enough evidence to charge Richard Crafts with the murder of his wife, Hella Crafts. On January 13th, 1987, the police closed in on the Crafts house to arrest Richard right at midnight. When they finally surround the house and asked him to come out, he refused. Police waited outside for over a half hour. They didn't want to engage in anything too crazy because they knew that Richard was inside with the three children and they didn't want to jeopardize the safety of those innocent children. Eventually, Richard came out and was arrested and taken in for processing. In the morning, he was arraigned. During the trial, the prosecution had a mountain of physical evidence against Richard. Here comes Henry Lee with the forensic side of things. Handwritten analysis from the receipts, DNA, the hair comparison, tool mark comparisons. It was a long trial, four months long, in 17 days of deliberation. But because of one juror who refused to vote for anything other than acquittal, they were forced to declare a mistrial. They went through a second trial though, a different jury where there will be no bias or prejudice. The prosecution had no murder weapon or crime scene, but they speculated that when Hella returned from her trip, her and Richard got into an argument about the divorce proceedings. Richard assaulted and murdered her in the bedroom with some kind of blunt object, possibly his police flashlight, proceeded to wrap her body in the bedroom carpet, then dragged her down the stairs and put her in the deep freezer he bought, left her there for a full day so it could be easier for him to cut up the body with the chainsaw. Then he went to drop the kids and the nanny off at his sister's house while the power was gone and came back to the house getting ready to dispose of his wife's body. He went and rented that wood chipper, came back to the house and took her body out of the freezer, cut her up with the chainsaw, went to the bridge and wood chipped her body over the bridge into the lake. Richard seemed very cold and nonchalant during the entire trial and showed no emotion. After three days, the jury reached their verdict. Guilty of murder in the first degree. On November 20th, 1989, he was sentenced to 50 years in prison, three years after his wife's murder. In conclusion, Richard Crafts ruined his life by murdering his wife just not to go through a divorce, which is pretty outrageous. This murder wouldn't have been solved without the help of forensics, even in its early stages. When you commit a crime, the forensic connection is always going to be there. Please don't be like Richard. I heard they called him Chip in jail. Crazy. Richard got out of jail about like three years ago. He went to a homeless shelter for veterans in Connecticut. But I also heard that he moved down south to Florida again. I know he had some connections down in Florida before. I want to thank you guys if you stuck with me for this long and watched my first video. I really appreciate it. And show your support, please, by hitting the like and the subscribe button. I'll be back next week for you guys with another case. Thank you so much again, and always remember, if you commit a crime, the forensic connection is always going to be there. Thank you, and take care.